can't see these things, we have to have something to stand on, and that's the Word of God. But what the Lord's going to show us today is there's also a battle going on for the Word of God. A battle going on in all of our lives for the Word of God. Now, if you have your Bibles and you want to try to keep up, we're going to start in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 3, Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed into the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. Now I want you to keep that in mind as we go along. The purpose of the gospel in this world is to bear fruit. The purpose of the gospel in our life is for us to bear fruit also. Paul goes on to say, if we drop down to verse 9, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of the will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, again, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. So that's the whole purpose whenever I say the Word of God has to be the, the most important thing. It's not just something special. I know a lot of times we, we have a lot of reverence for the Word of God, and this is a Bible that I treasure. It's from uh, 1761, and it's something we see a lot of these old Bibles, and we have leaves or pages hanging on our wall, and I love this. But without opening this, without studying this, this is useless. As cool as it is, as neat as it is to hold something this old and to have and to treasure, it doesn't mean anything if we're not allowing the Word of God to produce fruit in us. See, the Bible says the gospel will go out. The purpose of the gospel is to produce fruit. The fruit that the gospel produces is saved souls. And you and I are called, we don't save anybody, but we make disciples. So the purpose of God's Word in our life is for us to go out and produce fruit. The Bible says we'll be known by our fruit. Now, the thing that we have to understand is, and what the Lord is going to teach us today, if you want to go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on right now today. Right now as I speak, there's a war going on in your mind. There's a war going on in your heart. Satan doesn't want you to understand the Word of God. Satan is trying to destroy the Word of God. He tries to come in, and, and we'll see with the parable of the sower, he wants to take it away from you. He doesn't want the Word of God to grow in your life. He doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to be mature. And you've got to fight and you've got to battle to grow. It's not a given. Just because you're here today doesn't mean you're going to get anything from this sermon. It means nothing for you to be here. If you don't allow this Word to penetrate your heart and to cultivate it. We've got some farmers in the church. You know the most important thing when it comes to farming is the soil. And you've got to work the soil. You can throw out some seeds and sometimes, you know, if you just let a pumpkin die or something, it might grow, but to truly have the best possible uh, uh, harvest that you can, you've got to work the soil. And the soil is our heart, it's our minds. And you and I have to purpose in our heart and our mind, we've got to come here with an open heart and an open mind. We've got to come here, forget about what you're going to eat, forget about all these things that are going to distract us from this word, and have an open heart and an open mind to receive the word. Now, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus speaks a parable. We call it the parable of the sower, beginning in verse 1. It says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and the great crowds gathered around him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on a beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell upon, along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has an ear, let him hear." Now, if we drop down to verse 18, Jesus is going to explain the parable. And I want you to understand, as we go through this, I want you to think about your own life and your own walk with God and your own uh, time in the Word 
and, and this is going to become very important. I dare say this may be the most important sermon you've ever heard in your life. And it may be the hardest sermon you've ever heard in your life. God has a purpose for you in this world, and it's to be a light that shines. But you've got to fight for that light to shine. You've got to fight for the Word of God because there's a battle that goes on. Even now as I'm preaching, there's a battle going on. And here's the battle. Verse 18, Jesus says, Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Now, I have a, a, a responsibility to preach to you in a way that you understand. If I preach today and you guys don't understand what I'm preaching, it's useless. Satan comes and he takes it away. Now, you also have an understanding. You have a, a responsibility, I mean, to understand. And it may not be that you understand it fully today, but you've got to take this home and you've got to study it. You've got to break it down. The Word of God is important. And Satan wants to snatch it away from you. Now, the best compliment I think I've ever received is I was preaching one time in a living room. And after we got done, the lady told me that was hosting said, there was children sitting around and she said, you preach in such a way that if these kids would pay attention, they could understand the gospel. And that's the whole purpose. A lot of times we get up here and we try to sound smart, we try to sound theological, but if you guys don't get any understanding of this sermon today, it's useless. Uh, my wife is a school psychologist and a lot of times teachers and parents will tell her, we appreciate the way you explain things to us because a lot of times you can come in with these big fancy words and if they don't understand that it doesn't mean anything and my wife puts it this way you have to put it on a shelf where people can reach it and the word of God can be difficult in a lot of ways and even Jesus has to explain this parable but that's the purpose of what we're doing here today that's what God has sent me to do that's what your Sunday school teachers do they teach you they, they instruct you because Satan wants to come in and take this word from us Jesus goes on and says, As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, word, immediately he falls away. And that's why this is so important. We talk about persecution and tribulation that we're seeing in the world and we're going to see increase. If you're not grounded and rooted in the Word of God, you will fall in the face of persecution. We think we won't, but we will. And you and I have never seen persecution like our brothers and sisters all over this world today. See, it's, it's, it's unheard of. We, we would be just completely floored to know that right now our brothers and sisters in Christ truly have to make a decision whether they want to live for Christ or die. And when we face that persecution, when we face that tribulation, if we're not grounded and rooted, if that word is not rooted in our hearts and our minds, we'll go away. We'll walk away. We'll turn away. And we'll say, well, I can just, you know, pretend not to be a Christian, but God knows my heart. The Lord says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. See, this is very important. We have to be grounded and rooted in the word of God because we're going to start to see persecution pick up. We're going to start to see persecution and tribulation, especially of the true church. And we're even seeing it now uh, within the church because there's so much apostate, false doctrine being taught that when you and I try to stand on the true word of God, even Christian people, church people are going to come against us. And Mary Gillen Stu can talk about this and Pastor talks about this. Even when it comes to right to life, even when it comes to murdering innocent babies, Christians come against them. And if you're not grounded and rooted in the Word of God, you'll back down from that fight. Because it's a hard fight. Amen? Life's hard. we got to be grounded and rooted. Now remember, we're talking about a battle that's going on for the Word of God. Verse 22 says, As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the world, and this is probably most of us in here today, the one that we fight the most. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it is unfruitful. And if there's ever been a time where that's true, it's today. We are so busy 
It's almost ridiculous how busy people are, amen? And I don't know how you guys with kids even function. We're busy, we're overwhelmed, we're always wide open, right? We're go, 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 go. Overwhelmed. And I have so many people... Uh, even recently talked to me about I'm too busy to study the Word of God. I, I'm, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to come to church. I'm too busy to study. I just don't have time. That's what Jesus is talking about. The cares of this world, if we allow it to, choke the Word of God to the point that it's what? It's unfruitful. And that's what we're called to be, fruitful, amen? We're called pr to produce fruit. But Jesus is warning us today and, and the deceitfulness of riches. Then he says, as for the, what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the world, word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another 60 and in another 30. See, there's a battle going on for the word of God. And a lot of times, if we're not real careful as Christians, we think, well, we just come to church, and I've been saved a long time, and everything's good to go, and we just kind of cruise along through life, and we're waiting for heaven. But there's so much more to the Christian walk than that. Now listen, we may not be talking about your salvation, but rest assured, there's somebody in your circle that we're talking about their salvation. That's the fruit that the Word of God needs to produce in us so we can plant those seeds in them so that it produces fruit, which will be their salvation. See, we're called to be a light in this darkness. Where does that light come from? It's not always just smiling. It's not always being happy. It comes from the Word of God. The true light of the world is Jesus Christ himself. And if we don't have an understanding of that, if we're not rooted in that, when all these things come against us, and they do come against us, life is hard, right? We can all agree about that. If we're not rooted and grounded in the Word of God, we will fail in being fruitful, in producing fruit. See, there's so much more to being a Christian than heaven, right? I, I long for heaven. I told somebody just this past week, and I, you guys have heard me say this, if the Lord gives me the opportunity, I'll go right now. I'm ready. I want to go. That's where I want to be. If I could go today, right now, this instant, I would go. But God has a purpose for me however long I live here. I can't just sit back and wait to die. I can't just sit back and wait for heaven. He's got a purpose for me. He has a purpose for you. That's to produce fruit. And it's the word of God in us that will you, uh, we can use that will allow us to produce that fruit. So there's a battle. So what does that mean for you and me? Turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. There's a battle going on in our life. It, you have to war to be a Christian. Now listen, you can't earn your salvation, but it's going to cost you everything. It's a fight. It's a battle. You're in the Lord's army. See, we forget about that, or we may say that, but we don't understand. We're in a fight. Satan's fighting. Satan's warring. He, he's coming against us. He's coming against the church. Now remember, I've told you guys, there's no battle with God. Satan's not warring against God. He's warring against you. Satan can't attack God. He will attack you. He has and he will. He's attacking the church. He's attacking the word of God. He's attacking each one of us because he doesn't want you to grow. He doesn't want you to be fruitful. He doesn't, he's like, he's like a, a pesticide or, 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 or a herbicide. He's poison to your roots. And that's what, if you go around spraying Roundup on, on plants, they'll die. And you have to be real careful if you're trying to kill weeds because it'll overspray and it kills everything. That's what Satan wants to do in your life. He wants to destroy the root of God's word. He wants to destroy the meaning of God's word. He wants to destroy the purpose of God's word. And we're using that now with, with gender. We're using it with homosexuality. We're, he's, do, he's using it with abortion. He's coming against the word of God. And if you're not grounded and rooted in it, well, it sounds good that God loves homosexuals. That sounds really good. He does love homosexuals so much that he sent his son to die on a cross, but it's still a sin. You've got to be grounded and rooted in the Word of God. You've got to be grounded and rooted in the Word of God, and you've got to fight for it. So what does that fight look like? Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For, God, for what God has done, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us how does that happen who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit now watch this verse 5 for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit why is that important verse 6 for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that has set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law indeed it cannot those who are in the flesh cannot please God see there's a battle going on in our life and if you're not fighting for it if you're not purposing in your heart to set your mind on the things of God the things of this world they overwhelm us because a lot of times the fight that we have and the people what I hear people say yeah but I have to work of course you do yeah but I have to eat of course you do yeah but I live in this world the battle is in the spiritual realm but it manifests itself in the flesh that's why we have to war against spiritual principalities and powers of darkness we do that through the word of God and through prayer but it manifests itself here today so I'm not talking about like a lot of my heroes in the old times I love these guys but they had it wrong we, we talk about the Christian monks that went and lived in a monastery and they dedicated their life to God and they dedicated their life to prayer and they dedicated their life to studying scripture and a lot of times these were the guys that copied the Bible and and that was awesome but they had it wrong God didn't purpose us to go live in a monastery he purposed us to live in this world that's why it's so hard we have to live in the world but not be of the world and, and it's a war that we fight and that's why I asked uh, Kelsey I've been practicing where she at did she leave I've been practicing her name because I, I always want to call her Chelsea and I'm like Tracy is it Kelsey is it Chelsea she's like it don't matter she'll she'll answer Kelsey Brandon's beautiful bride let's call her that amen I asked her to sing this song because that's what we're to be a wayfaring stranger if you go to first Peter chapter 2 beginning in verse 11 Peter urges the church and the Lord's urging us today through Peter beloved I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which what wage war against your soul if you have the king james it says we're to be strangers and pilgrims we're to be different we're, we're, we're to separate ourselves we should look different than the world the way that we talk should be different the way that we act should be different our priorities should be different our love should be different everything about us even though we are humans we're not aliens like et right but, but we should, our life needs to look different. What separates us from the world? It's the purpose of God in our life. It's the power of God's word in our life. It's our focus that we have to be willing to separate from the things of this world and understand that even the good things of this world can be a hindrance in our walk with God. Remember, Jesus said, it's the cares of this world that snuff out, that suffocate the word. It, it, they're the weeds that grow up and they take the nutrients, they, they take, that's the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, our focus, where is it? Verse 12 says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We have to be different. You've got to fight to be different. It's easy. A lot of times you see the Christian fish going against the flow. It's easy to go with the flow. Because when we go with the flow, and, and it's like in India, right? Pastors taught us this, and Pastor Moses, you, you can say Jesus is a God, they don't have a problem with that. When you say Jesus is the only God, then they have a problem with that. And we can go along with the world, and we don't want to call out sin, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but when we stand against the things of the world, there's going to be a problem for you as a Christian. You've got to be willing to do that. See, that's why it hurts me and what keeps me awake at night is this prosperity gospel that God only wants to bless you and if you give your life to Christ, everything's going to be all good and you'll always be healthy and you'll be rich and that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says the exact opposite. 
that you're going to be persecuted. You're going to have tribulation. Your family is going to be divided. Your friends are going to be divided. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. That sword is the truth of God's word. And if you're not standing on that, it's easier just to keep peace with your family. Amen? It's easier to keep peace at your job side. It's easier not to take a stand. But if you understand that it's the word of God that we're standing on and it's his purpose and that he will never leave you nor forsake you, when you're rooted and grounded in that, we'll see in a minute what Paul says that we can stand against no matter what comes against us. So how do we do that? Again, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Your life has to become a sacrifice. Do you guys know what a sacrifice is? It means something that you put to death. You put your physical life, you put what your desires, your body becomes a sacrifice to God. What does that mean? You deny yourself, you take up your cross, and you follow him. And that goes against everything the world wants you to do. The world wants you to follow your flesh. The world wants you to follow your pleasures. The world wants you to follow money. The world wants you to follow prestige, fame, fortune, popularity. All the things of the flesh that snuff out the Word of God. The Word of God tells us we're to be different. We're to be pilgrims, sojourners, however you say that word, exiles, aliens, different so you have to sacrifice. That's why I said this may be the hardest sermon you've ever heard because it's hard. You may stand all alone. You may lose friends. You may lose family. It's hard to sacrifice your life to God. What the church now teaches us is you can live however you want. You can live like the world. And God's okay with that. That's not what the Bible teaches. So, But if you don't know that, that sounds good. Verse 2, how do you do that? Do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? This is what renews your mind. You put this in, and it changes your thinking. You filter every decision you make through the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? How, what, does the word, what does the Bible say I should act like? What does the Bible say I should prioritize? What, the, what does the Bible say my language should look like? Let me tell you something. I hear it all the time. If you're a Christian, you should not cuss. Amen? The Bible says that our, our, our language should be, it sh it should be uh, seasoned with good. It shouldn't be coarse. The Bible even says, and this one hurts me, that you shouldn't, there should be no coarse jesting, no joking. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We have to be real careful about our language. Uh, people tell me all the time, oh, I'm a Christian and I can cuss. That's not what the Bible says. Now, I'm not saying if you cuss that you've committed a great sin, you're going to go to hell or anything like that. But what I'm saying is the Bible says we're to be different our language should be different. Our focus should be different. The topic of our conversations should be different. I have people at work that, that they know me a while and they'll come before. Now they don't even come to me. But before they come, they say, hey, I want to tell you a joke. And I'd say, is this a joke I want to hear? And they'd say, probably not. And go on because they know I don't want to hear that. Now, listen, there's people at my work, grown men, grown women that cuss like sailors. They can do that. A lot of times they'll apologize to me and I'll say, you don't have to apologize to me. You're a grown adult. You talk how you want to talk. I'm not going to talk that way. And as long as you're not cussing me, we're not going to have a problem because you're a grown up. Talk how you want to talk. But I, I can't talk that way. And even a lot of times I have to, I lose my cool. I lose my temper and I have to go apologize. And they're like, no big deal. It is a big deal because I represent Christ. So we can't be conformed to the pattern of this world. We can't be like the world. How do we do that? We transform our mind by the renewing of our mind, which is the Word of God. Why? So that we can test. You may be, by, by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now remember, I know I'm going fast. So I'm throwing a lot at you. This is very important. Satan is warring against the church. He's wanting to destroy the Word of God. Remember, the garden, the very first question in the Bible, did God really say? From the very beginning, that's what Satan is. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He wants to twist God's word. And he knows God's word better than you and I. That's why we have to be grounded and rooted in it because he's twisting it. You have to not conform to the world. Now, what does that look like? Again, Philippians chapter 3. This is where Paul is stating who he is. See, Paul was on a fast track for a political gain. He could have been very powerful, 
very wealthy, but he sacrificed all of that for the purpose of Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, this is what he says. This is, it's going to be hard, but this is where you and I have to get to today. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Why? For the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of what? Of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says, I've counted everything as loss. Because this is more important. Knowing God is more important than making money, than, than being successful, than being popular. He goes on to say, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as what? Rubbish, trash. In order of what? That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may what? Share in his suffering, becoming like him in death, a living sacrifice. Paul says, I've become a living sacrifice. I become like him in his death. I've sacrificed my will, my purpose to the Father's will. And that's what Jesus did. He said, nobody takes my life, but I obey the Father and I put myself on a cross for the salvation of the world. He became a living sacrifice. The same thing is true, has to be true for you and I. It's hard. This is a very hard thing for us to comprehend because we think that we do that. We think that we live that life. We think, or maybe it's just me, that I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my strength and all my heart and everything that in me. We think that we love our neighbor as ourselves. It's a very difficult thing to do. Without the power of the Word of God, You'll never be able to love someone that much. It's just not humanly possible without the Spirit of God. And if you don't understand that that's what God demands of His disciples, you won't do it. Because people are hard to love. Amen? Now I'm going to throw some more Scriptures out at you, and these are going to be very hard Scripture. Not me. Tracy, uh, her papa used to always say when he was a preacher, when he was able to preach, I didn't write the Bible. If I would have wrote it, it would have been different. This doesn't come from me. This is straight from the Word of God. That's why I said 97 verses. I can't will it down anymore. That's the most important thing. But these are going to be real hard verses, and I don't want you to dismiss them. This is important. This is the Word of God. James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. How do you keep yourself unstained by the world? You war against the flesh. Because the things of the flesh will stain you. Lustfulness, lying, greed, adultery, drug addiction, whatever it is, the things of the flesh, they stain you. You've got to war against those things. How do you do that? You set your mind on the things of God and not the things of the flesh. That's the only way. It's not a matter of just saying, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church and I'm just going to cruise this life. It's a battle. If you don't get any other verse today, get this one. 1 John chapter 2. Write it on your hand. Write it on your forehead. This is the word of God speaking to us today. 1 John chapter 2. Beginning in verse 15, do not love the world, world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever ask yourself do you love god more than you love the world do you love god more than you love yourself that's a legitimate question it's a hard question we all want to say yes but where's your fruit what does your fruit bear out now i want to say something real quick before i move on when the bible says do not love the world he's not talking about people see in john 
chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. It's two different things. We're not talking about people. You have to love people. The whole purpose of the cross was people, was us. We're not talking about people. We're talking about the material world. We're talking about the things of the world. We're talking about the things that Paul, a few verses ago, said, I counted all as trash. We're counting about the pleasures of the world. You have to be willing to hate those things and love God. It's not equal. It's not 50-50. It's not split. The Bible says we have to love God more than anything else, even our own father and mother. And what that means is he has to take preeminence. He has to be priority. And you have to fight for that to happen. It will not just happen on its own. It doesn't mean anything because you repented of your sin. It doesn't mean anything. It's a battle. It's a fight. It's a war to put God first because Satan doesn't want God first. He doesn't mind God being equal, but Jesus said uh, that you have to love the Father more than you love even your brother, your sister, your mother. Even the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's not one, two, three. That means in my presence. That means here, like you guys are here before me today. That means there should be no other gods even in the presence of the one true God in your life. Nothing but God. And that's a war. That's a fight. Because you have to live in this world. John chapter 4, verse 4. See, this is a very hard verse, and it should scare us to death. John chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, who, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy to God. Now, I don't have to ask you to raise your hand. I don't think anybody in here wants to be an enemy to God. But the Bible says, not Mark, not Roger, the Bible says, if you want to be a friend to the world, that makes you an enemy to God. Why? Because what Jesus said, it's the world that snuffs out the Word of God. And if you want to be a friend of that, it makes you an enemy because that world is snuffing out the Word of God in your life. So you got to push away from that. You want the Word of God to grow in your life? you got to separate yourself from the world. you got, you got to put the Word of God as a priority. That's the only way it'll grow. And I'm not talking about a little devotional on your phone for a minute a day. I'm, not talk, I'm talking about real deal Bible study. Now, I've had some people recently and last week and, and different, different times have told me, I don't read very well. I don't have time. There, there's no excuse for us today to not have the Word of God. I come home, and Tracy's in bed when I get off work, and a lot of times I'll come home, and her phone is laying on her nightstand beside her as she goes to sleep, and she's playing the Word of God. A lot of times when she gets up to get ready for work, she plays the Word of God. You can play it in your, your car on the way to work. Listen, I was reading today, I was looking at it this morning. You can, you can go to YouTube or you can buy it on CD. You can let Johnny Cash read the Word of God to you. See, I was reading a story. Johnny Cash's mom badgered him so long to record the Word of God that he finally gave in before he died. You can let Johnny Cash read the Word of God to you. You can get a dramatized version of the Word of God. That's not just for kids. It helps you to understand when you can hear the different voices, the different female, male, the voice of God. It just, put that in your mind. Let that be number one, the Word of God. There's no excuse. All of us. I'm not saying you have to get a real old Bible and have a, uh, an old, old lantern and you have to, to separate yourself and put yourself in a closet. I'm not talking about that. I do believe that an actual physical, physical Bible is better than your phone, but there's no excuse. Do what you have to do to get the Word of God in you. Make it a priority because if it's not a priority, it's not going to grow. It's just not. Satan's going to snuff it out. The cares of the world is going to snuff it out. You've got to have this purpose in your life to make this number one. You're going to have to sacrifice something, whether it be sleep, whether it be TV, whether it be whatever it is, food, whether it be, I mean, something in your life is going to have to go. And whatever it is can't be as important as this. Are you going to have to sleep? Unless you're a pastor, apparently, you're going to have to sleep. You're going to have to eat? Sure. You're going to have to have time with your kids. I'm not saying to the detriment of everything else in your life, but you guys know where you're at with the Word of God. Is this number one? See, we pour out our life to make money. I would venture to say the number one thing in everybody's life that we have spent our life doing is making money. 
Amen? Even an average work week's 40 hours. Now, pastor shook his head yes in first service. He's not here today. But let me ask you, anybody in here ever spent 40 hours in the Word of God in a week? That's eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. Anybody? Yeah, me either. But you want me to, say, you want me to tell you something? I've had a lot of people tell me about pastor. I wish I knew the Word of God like he does. You want to know how you know the Word of God like he does? You spend 40 hours a week in the Word of God. Now, am I saying 40 hours? I don't know what it is. Is it an hour? Is it two? It's probably more than where you're at today. Amen? It is in my life. Because if you're not fighting and warring for this to be number one, it won't be. It'll sit on a shelf. And, and I know a lot of people worship this. This isn't to be worshiped. People say, oh, I've got a Bible. It won't burn. I promise you. People say, you know, I know Bibles have survived fires and stuff. It will burn. Or people say it'll stop a bullet or whatever. Hold it up and let me shoot you. There's nothing special about this until you dig into it. See, we're worshiping the wrong thing. We have reverence for God's Word, but we don't know God's Word. You can't, you can't just carry this around with you and hold it up like a magic wand. It doesn't work that way. You've got to have it rooted down in your heart. The only way that happens is, hopefully, through the preaching here today, hopefully, let me sidestep and say this, if you don't come to Sunday school, you need to be coming to Sunday school. That's part of it. Wednesday nights, I know we don't have it all the time, but your kids have Bible study. Ask them, what did you learn in Sunday school? Study with your kids. Bring this in. Watch these videos again, over and over again. You can go back. We have, they're all on YouTube. You can go back. Watch them. Make this, I'm not just talking about reading. I'm not just talking about, I can't, oh, you mean I can't do watch TV? I'm not talking about what you can't do. I'm talking about what you should do. Let me just say this. If you never watched TV again and spent every waking minute studying the Word of God, you would be more fruitful. You would be a more mature Christian. Is that reasonable? Maybe not. But what is reasonable? The Bible says it's our reasonable service to sacrifice ourselves for the purpose of God. You want to memorize a verse this week? Memorize this one. It's real easy. It's real short. You probably already know it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. For godliness with contentment is great gain. Why is that important? Paul says in chapter 6, verse 7, he says, For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Why is that important? Remember, we're talking about the Word of God. We're talking about Satan taking the Word of God. Verse 9 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into a many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Remember what Jesus said. The love of money, it's, it's the, de the deception of money, comes up and snatches the Word of God. The cares of this world, the things that we think are important, really aren't. Everybody in here knows you, 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 you have a mortgage, your house, a tornado can take it tomorrow. Your roof will leak. You go out and buy a brand new car. And in just a little while, it's obsolete. Phones, whatever it is, all this stuff, it, it's not important. You can't take it with you. But that's what our focus is on. Now listen, and th the reason I keep saying this is because this is what I hear. Well, I have to have a house. Of course you have to have a house. But is that your focus? Is the things of this world your focus? Or is the Word of God your focus? So what are we supposed to do? Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 tells us what we're supposed to do. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What is that? It's the Word of God. 